everyone. Thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura, and today I am joined by my brother, Joseph. Hey, so Joe, welcome back. back. Yeah, it's great to be back. <laughs> so Joe was on a previous episode for We Were Soldiers, which was like over a year ago now. And that one has been my second most played podcast episode ever. The number one most played was a new release. So the fact that We Were Soldiers is number two is a big deal because it's not like that was even a new release. Awesome. So yeah, you guys should definitely check out the episode for We Were Soldiers. I will link to it. The video is just the audio because that's before I did YouTube. But yeah, also this is my 99th book first movie. So next week will be my 100th. So I'm planning on doing a Q&A or something to celebrate 100 book first movie episodes. But yeah, do you want to tell people what we're covering today? Yeah, hey, so... Uh... Today we'll be covering uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, many of you are probably aware that Netflix recently released a, a movie adaptation. Um, so that's the movie we're going to be um, comparing, kind of talking it through. There are two other movie adaptations that have been done. The 1930 version is, is of course, very famous, was incredibly popular on release, and is, is a very good film for sure, definitely one I would recommend. Um, there was a 1979, I believe, made-for-TV movie, which is, which is for a made-for-TV movie, is, is, is good as well, and probably I, maybe the most faithful adaptation, I would say, of the book. It definitely follows it, um, I would say, more closely than the Netflix mm -hmm. version. But that being said, that's that's one we're going to be talking about in depth is the Netflix uh, 2022. 2022 release. Directed yeah. by Edward Berger and the book is from 1928 and was written by Eric Maria Remarque. Yeah, I mean, it works for that one. <laughs> yeah. And this is also the only German adaptation and the author is German. So that's interesting to know. So this book is about World War I. So the author served in World War I and then 10 years later, he wrote an anti-war novel about his experience. And I thought it was interesting before we get into the book, did you know that before World War II, Nazis burned this book because they didn't want Germans reading it yeah. because it was so anti-war and it told the truth and the horrors of war. And then also the author was not in Germany at the time, but his sister was, and so they killed his sister. Oh, wow, I didn't know about his sister being killed. That's, yeah. wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And so, so yeah, it's about a guy, Paul, in World War I, fighting on the German side. Right from the start, we see that he is disillusioned and uh, with the horrors of war. But yeah, what were your general book thoughts? Also, you suggested covering this one. So like, was there any particular reason or just a new release and that's why? Yeah, so uh, I had read All Quiet on the Western Front when I was in school uh, about 15, mm. 20 years ago. I think he did their junior high or high school. Uh, I saw the trailer for the Netflix movie and, and I, I thought the trailer was really really good I actually um was like this this actually I think is gonna be a super good movie and so as soon as I saw that I was like oh this is like a perfect opportunity you know all quiet on the western front is a, like a classic you know mm -hmm. by by anyone's definition it was incredibly popular upon release yeah uh, initially in Germany it became a worldwide success it was a th the number one bestseller in America in 1929 and it has definitely stood the test of time it it is basically the gold standard, um, I would say, for, you know, kind of first person perspective um, in war. There's some other really good books that have been written since in terms of like novels. Um, you know, Catch-22 obviously is incredibly popular, Slaughterhouse. My favorite of those would probably be uh, With the Old Breed, which is a World War II. But this this one is, like, like I said, I think the gold standard and is uh, definitely a book I would recommend for anyone to read. Yeah. And also, we have so many books and movies about World War I. So it was interesting to read about World... Or sorry, did I say... We have so many books and movies about World War II. So it was interesting mm -hmm. to read one about World War I because I, I feel like it just doesn't get written about as much. Yeah, yeah. I kind of feel like it's coming back, uh, you know, with the... Uh, um, 1917, which was recently oh, released, yeah. which was yeah. another World War One. That was a good one. Um, which which I enjoyed for sure. Um, so I had never read this book before, and there were like so many scenes that were just so vivid, and it was more graphic than I expected too. Mm -hmm. So it's very graphic, very vivid, very like clearly showing how terrible World War One was. And it also was interesting because it's not necessarily plot driven, like because it's just different events, but it's like. I don't know, what am I trying to say? It's not like there was a plot where you're like, oh, what's gonna happen? Because you already kind of know. And so it was just these different scenarios within the war and showing how he was affected by these different situations. Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way it was published. So when it was initially published, it was part of a periodical. So right. each chapter was released. And this this obviously was very common if you look at uh, you know the Christmas Carol, that's yeah. how that was released. So. Uh, it wasn't unusual, and then it was so popular in publication that as soon as it was done, it was it was uh, released as a novel, and obviously mm -hmm. did very very well there. So yeah, I, I had the same sense. It's almost like you know eight or ten or however many scenes 
where you like shows you depicts almost a short story. Yeah. It just happens to be the same person um, yeah. throughout. And I, and I would say of those short stories, there were really three that stood out to me the most. So when I when I chose this book and I was rereading it uh, for the podcast, there was one scene that I was kind of waiting for because I remembered it really well. Mm-hmm. And it was the scene. It's pretty early in the hospital where it's his friend who's who's in the hospital. And he's dying and he's um, visiting him. Actually, that's not the scene I wanted to talk about. Uh, I would do want to talk about that one later, actually. Yeah. But the the scene that I remembered was the one where he goes home. Oh. And he's, like, going back to Germany, you know, his town that he's from, and he's mm-hmm. visiting his family. And then at the end of that that chapter, it ends with him saying, like, I should have never gone home. Mm-hmm. Like, it was a horrible idea. Like, not, not a positive experience. And as, like, a young boy who has, like, never left his home before, like, it's such a such a huge shift in mentality that I think you know, maybe later in life, I wouldn't have necessarily appreciated that as much. And it definitely wasn't as emotional reading it um, this time. But as a young child, I remember I was just like, why wouldn't you want to go home? Mm -hmm. Like you're in a trench getting shot at and you go home and you're like, this sucks. But I think it plays into this, you know, obviously the larger narrative as well, because it is sort of a twisted coming of age story. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you already talked a little bit, kind of the loss of innocence and, um, you know, sort of reevaluating who you trust and the messages that you get. But of course, in a coming of age story, normally it's about growth and development. And this, like, yeah, there's growth, but you're also becoming permanently damaged, whether that's through physical injury or just... Mental and emotional. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For sure. So the movie doesn't have the part when he's on leave. We can just say that right now. So that's going to change. But yeah, that was interesting, too, because like if he hadn't gone home, maybe he could have had this idealized version of home in his mind. But because he went home and he couldn't, he had a hard time connecting with people and seeing his mom had cancer and they couldn't afford the surgery and so just seeing the reality of home and how he's changed maybe being home also made him realize even more how much he had been changed by the war for sure so yeah i thought it was interesting the movie cut that out but yeah do you wish the movie had kept that scene um so i you know obviously whenever you're turning a a book into a movie there's some things that just don't lend themselves as Mm. well to you know the visual form of, of film so overall um i liked the netflix version i definitely like give it a thumbs up i'd recommend mm-hmm. people watch it um i enjoyed it but i do think it missed some of the character development that the book had um and and part of that too was they added some scenes so if you look at like all quiet on the western front the book it is told completely from paul's yeah. perspective you never see anyone else's perspective mm-hmm. he never tries to see the world from anyone else's viewpoint this is his experience in the trenches of World War One, and, and there's a little bit of, obviously, the precursor as he's getting ready and training up, and then his, like, leave. But besides that, like, yeah. that's that's all it is. Whereas the movie, you get a couple scenes with the general, you mm. get some information about the armistice and kind of, you know, the, the German side, how that came to be. Uh, and, and I think some of that, I get, it kind of has to happen, right? Yeah. So you kind of talked about the, the book was published in 1929. World War One ended in 1918. So you don't need to set the scene for your Because everybody knows it. <laughs> yeah, you're like, hey, I was on the Western Front 1916 mm-hmm. to 1918. And you're like, oh, crap, like, this is going to be intense. Yeah. You know, a Western audience now, like, you don't necessarily know. It's over like, 100 years ago. Right, right. And so, they're, they're, you know, framing that. And, and I guess, so an example I would give in the book, the book ends with Paul dying October 1918. There's, there's no reference to the armistice. Mm-hmm. There's no date. It's just like, yeah, he died October 1918. And I think when I read it the first time, I think that kind of went over my head that it was like a month away, like Before weeks away, maybe days away from this armistice being signed and the war being over. And so I think the movie wanted to kind of highlight and give a frame of reference of, you know, what's going on in the larger, you know, German population at large. Mm-hmm. And... and I think the juxtaposition was significant. Like yes. every time they show, you know, the trenches, it's dreary, it's dark, it's They're like, starving. Yeah, it's almost like very black and white, gray. And then so colorful on the train and yep. the scene where the guy is complaining about a day old croissant. Yeah. And all the sur- soldiers are yeah. starving. Like having so. rats eat their bread. Yeah. So yeah. I did like how, yeah, I went back and forth with mm-hmm. that. And then also I wanted to mention Daniel Bruhl. I think that's how you say his last name, mm-hmm. but he was the actor from Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was cool seeing yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I liked that addition of the character. I think it was valid. The, the general, um, I, I didn't agree with that depiction as as much. So one of the challenges when you're you know writing a book that's kind of anti-war is how do you depict 
like senior leaders, right? Yeah. Because the reality is the, these men are making decisions. And I say men because obviously World War One, there, there weren't they any were women men. in the armed services or at the senior levels of the German government or, or any of the governments, um, frankly, that, that were involved in World War One, um, making these decisions. And so you had these men who were making these decisions that were resulting in people dying, mm-hmm. a lot of people dying, their own people dying, as well as those of the enemy. And, and so it's difficult, I think, for artists especially to kind of wrap their head around like how could a person make these decisions and it's very easy to kind of build this straw man of like oh he's just violent and he's evil and he's a narcissist or whatever the case may be Mm -hmm. and and those i'm not saying that those people don't exist and that there weren't senior leaders in the military who who had those traits i mean you have the nuremberg trials for a reason right there are Mm -hmm. people who unfortunately you know make evil decisions in war uh but i think you know in in this instance i i think they tried a little bit to kind of flesh out this general and his character but i i I think they kind of went on the easy button and didn't really capture the essence of of some of these senior leaders and and their motivation because it is it is a very complex thing um you know a, a lot of the senior leaders in germany a lot of the senior generals in in um in the book, like I said, it doesn't try to capture other people's perspective, but most of the depictions of his immediate supervisors are very positive. He talks about his mm-hmm. company commander being great, you know, his positive thoughts about the lieutenant. Obviously, there's a negative depiction of um, the drill instructor uh, when he's training mm-hmm. up and of the major when he goes on leave. But um, there's more nuance, I would say, in the book than in the version we get um, in the Netflix in the film. And then are you specifically talking about the guy who was bald, where 15 minutes before mm-hmm. the end of the war, he was like, we're mm-hmm. going in again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I was kind of curious about that scene, because obviously that is, it's almost hard to fathom, right? Like, why yeah. would you be like, you know, this war is about to be over. Why would you do what's that? What's the point? And so what's crazy is there was actually a congressional hearing for America in the U.S., because American generals were doing that. Oh, So wow. it wasn't just, and, and some say actually it was more common on the Allied side than the German mm. side, just because morale was so low in Germany at the time. But in America, it definitely happened. There was a case where a general had to, it was either a colonel or a general had to go and talk to Congress because they were like, you were supposed to start this operation November 13th and you bumped it up to November 11th, the morning of, do you have a reason? And, and look at it, it's, it's, it's a complicated matter, right? Like these, these are generals who are fighting this war yeah, there's rumors it's going to end, mm-hmm. but what if what if Germany changes their mind? What if Germany's like, you know what, we want to stick this a little bit longer, right? And, and it's frankly one of the tragedies of war is is the violent nature of it. Yeah, uh, and then to get into like more chronological how the story goes along. So I did like so in the book we are just tossed into oh, Paul. Yeah. He's in the middle of the war. Whereas the movie starts out, so we start out with this other German soldier named Heinrich who is fighting and then he dies and then they take his body and the other dead soldiers and then they take their clothing and whatever is useful. And so we see Heinrich's jacket or yeah, his jacket sent to a sewing place where they fix it up. And then we see Paul who's like excited with his friends, excited to enlist. And then he gets Heinrich's jacket and he's like, oh, this already belongs to someone else. And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, you know, it just didn't fit him. And they ripped the tag out. So I thought that was a really good intro. And I did like that where I felt more like we were in the journey with Paul, like seeing him mm. at the beginning made it feel like we were in it with him. Whereas in the book, we're just tossed into it. And he's like explaining to us, if that makes sense. So I felt like in the yeah. movie, it helped me feel more connected to Paul having that intro. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think they, they set the scene they took more time to do that, definitely, yeah. in the movie. Yeah. I will say with the movie, one thing that, that kind of annoyed me, though, since we're talking the intro, it, and it happens throughout, it felt like you're, I was watching, like, a screensaver for at least, like, several <laughs> seconds. They're like, oh. look at these foxes. Yeah. <laughs> look at the forest. And then, like, they'll pan in and be like, look at this dude's face. We're just going to do this for a couple seconds. And you're like, <laughs> and the movie's a little long. And that's, yeah. that was one of my, probably my biggest complaint about the movie. Large, like, I got it. Your cinematography is amazing. <laughs> but, like, well, you're telling a story, okay? I can I can stare at, like, screenscapers yeah. on my computer yeah. when I'm, like, logging into Some work or something. Some movies get too caught up in the Right. They're like, it's so thing. aesthetically beautiful. Look what we've made. <laughs> Like, I did okay. think the fox was interesting, like because it was a mother fox feeding its yeah, yeah. pups. And the shells stuff. are going off in the background. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, it's nature. Very poetic. Right, right. <laughs> and like, oh, the juxtaposition of all this. <laughs> yeah. um, um, and then, so in the 
book, I felt like with his comrades or his fellow soldiers, Mm -hmm. Cat was the main guy who he was really good friends with. The other ones, I would sometimes, like, get them confused and they would kind of get jumbled in my mind. Whereas in the movie, because you're seeing them, it was easier to be like, okay, this is, there's one guy named John, I think. It's spelled with a T, but it's John and, like, friends and all the others. So I felt like that was a pro for the movie is that I could keep his fellow soldiers more in line. Whereas in the book, they would kind of mesh together sometimes. The movie, the thing that comes to mind, like, Black Hawk Down for me is kind of that movie where I'm just like, who are they? Like, who is that person? Like, I don't, I don't. I, I can't differentiate any of these people. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think, a common theme with a lot of war movies is True. like everyone sort of blends together and you're kind of like, I don't, I don't really know who this person <laughs> is anymore. But. Yeah. Oh, and then one change, I could be remembering this wrong, but a movie added that Cat had a wife and a son who had died, which I don't remember that in the book. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't remember that in the book I, either. I um, do think the movie, it seemed like they, I mean, we got to know Cat in the book, but I felt like the movie tried even harder to re- like really let us get to know Cat because he ends up dying. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> and so whenever I know a character is going to a die in a movie, I always notice how movies like are good at manipulating you where it's like really get to know this person and right. care about them because right. we're going to have them die and we want you to feel it. Right. So right. I did think the movie did that with Cat in particular. Yeah. Because in the, the book... I mean, every, everyone just kind of dies, like, so there, you, you get a little bit of a, like, you know, you obviously feel for all of them, right? They're all yeah. young men yeah. going to this war for various reasons, uh, and, you know, they're dying. <laughs> so yeah. it's, uh, Whereas in the movie, yeah, I think they did a better job making them more distinct. Like, there was one mm-hmm. guy, um, his last name was Crop, or the character name was Crop. He had, like, the dark hair. Mm-hmm. I thought that actor was really good. I should have written his name down, but he was the one where... Fran sees the French girl and he runs over yeah, to them. Yeah, yeah, But the guy that stays b- back yeah. and doesn't want to go and then he rips off the poster of the girl. And yeah, yeah. I just really liked that character and yeah, I really yeah. felt for him. No, and he was kind I, of funny but also just sad. Right, right, right. No, I would agree. I was, I was actually watching a, a clip comparing the two scenes from the 1930 and the 2002 film. And yeah, the character from the two, the, the 2022 film um, definitely, I don't know what it is. You sort of have this, like, there's a comedic element, yeah. but there's also, like, pay, I don't know. You're definitely, like, empathizing with him. You're like, oh, man, I can totally see myself <laughs> chilling at the front with this guy. He's so weird. He's sort of, you know, yeah. being a character. And speaking of the French girls, that's another change, is in the movie, it's just one guy goes to hang out with them, and we don't see what happens. Whereas in the book, like, all of them go over, because they see mm-hmm. them earlier, and and then they go over to the French girl's home later that evening. Uh, so we see Paul as he interacts with these French girls. Do they have sex? I don't even remember now. Uh, so pa- Paul, I think some of them probably do. But, but I, Paul I just talks to her. Yeah, yeah. Paul yeah. is sort of classic. But um, yeah. Yeah. Th- so there was a, a lot of changes. So I'm going to be honest. The first 40 minutes of the movie, I was kind of like, this isn't all quiet on the Western Front. Like this is like a World War One movie. Yeah. Like after that, it's they start borrowing much more heavily from the book. But at, like the first forty minutes, a lot of artistic license was taken in my opinion. Yeah, because there's a scene at the beginning of the book that doesn't happen. Like when the guy when they want to get their food and he's like, "I have food for this many people." Yeah, like that whole thing yeah. happens near the like, end of the movie. Yeah, the and that's third. the first scene yeah. of the book. Like, yeah, that's literally how it starts. And then also in the book, there's the part where they're visiting the guy in the hospital and they know he's gonna die, but they're trying to make him mm-hmm. feel good. And one guy wants his boot because he's like mm-hmm. I mean he's gonna die and someone's gonna get his boots and I want them yeah. and that also wasn't in the movie yeah which is crazy because in my so you know I talked a little bit about the scene that I remembered the most as a, as a you know younger kid reading it but it like th- this time and as I was reading obviously I'm sort of remembering it mm-hmm. reading it the first time too but the most emotional scene in my opinion was that scene with this soldier who's like slowly dying in front of him mm-hmm. uh, and apparently it was also like a very um controversial scene in Germany because they were like whoa whoa we had really good hospitals stuff like that wasn't happening Um, but I think it's it's really powerful for a couple reasons in the book and one of them is it's giving you perspective on the scale which likes it doesn't really happen most of the book you're just focused on this character a few of his buddies who are in this squad and that's it but this is a scene where, like, they, they grab the doctor and he's like, oh, man, I've been doing, like, however many surgeries mm-hmm. today. I don't remember who this dude is. And yeah. that's when you're just like, oh, man, like, this is insane. Like, this doctor has done so many surgeries, he can't even differentiate. And it's not so many surgeries, like, over an extended period. Like, today, today. <laughs> he has literally cut off, like, uh, multiple people's limbs. And 
Another scene that was not in the movie, but in the book later on, Paul and some of his other comrades are in a hospital mm -hmm. and they're in a hospital train. But yeah, they don't make the doctors look good because they talk about how quick the doctors are to amputate. And some of the doctors, like they would manipulate soldiers into agreeing to be amputated because they would be like, no, like, or no, it was the flat feet where he's like, he's going to try to fix your flat feet, but like, don't get him to do it. Mm -hmm. But then they both do agree because the doctor kind of manipulates them. So some doctors almost seemed it almost seemed like they saw it as a way to experiment on these soldiers yeah. and try to do this or that. And that wasn't in the movie either. Yeah, it was the, I think maybe this scene that gave me like sort of the biggest like, oh, wow, was the scene uh, at the end where they are visiting their friend in a field hospital. Mm -hmm. And he grabs the fork and he's like, yeah. and you're just like, oh, gee. Yeah. But that's not in the book. They, although they reference a guy who they had to keep yeah. silverware away yeah. from. And he probably had attempted it before. Yeah. Um, so it's, that, it's not like that was like some sort of artistic rendering that's totally unrealistic. Like, I, I'm sure it happened. Yeah. And that scene in the movie, which we're jumping ahead, but that scene made me cry in the movie, which I thought there was a scene in the book we'll get to. And I thought that one would have made me cry in the movie, but it didn't. But it was that scene in the movie when uh, it's the guy named John and he's in the hospital and they go get food and they bring it back to him. Mm -hmm. And like Kat and Paul are in a good mood and they're like sharing the soup with this guy thinking he's mm -hmm. feeling better. Better. And then while they're sitting in front of him, he stabs himself with the fork. And yeah, that was such a sad scene. Also just building up because all this horrible stuff has been happening. And then something about that scene is just like, man. So it was a great scene, but a uh, really sad one. And yeah. this movie is like, it's very violent, of course. And there were scenes where it almost felt like a horror movie in a way because of the violence and because of like how horrible everything was. And the scene with the tanks I thought was really well done. And that almost felt like a monster horror movie when the tanks are coming over and they're like so terrified. Yeah. So I thought that was really well done. And, and that's why I liked the trailer so much when I was watching it because a couple of years ago, I read, read uh, a book I, I referenced a little earlier with the old breed. And uh, he talks about war as like the meat grinder. And as I'm reading his book, I, I was thinking, I was like, man, like this is like horror movie like mm -hmm. level stuff. Like, And so when I saw the trailer, I was like, man, this might finally be the might movie that captures like just how truly like horrible war is, especially World War One. World War One was, I think, on a, on a whole nother level that the yeah. amount of gas that was being dropped was mm -hmm. unprecedented. The use of artillery like before since like after as it never really repeated so people at the front there was really no escape like usually you look at like historic ancient combat right you, like you go in yeah you know you got all your gear you're fighting but the battle's over you all go into your separate camps and you're kind of hanging out and then maybe you fight again somewhere else or whatever this it's like the sound of artillery never went away yeah. like unless you were super far away from the front like you being in the rear wasn't like it didn't necessarily feel that far away it was still very much present and and obviously the period of the battle also is a lot longer instead of being this brief physical conflict mm -hmm. on a field of battle you're sitting in your bunker taking this artillery fire and it's not just the horror of artillery fire like a lot of cases especially during heavier barrages you know what's coming mm -hmm. like this barrage is anticipating an oncoming attack from the other side uh and so yeah i think you know World War One, in terms of like PTSD and sort of like mental trauma, I don't know if there's been a war before or after that can, that can compete with, with what they were experiencing on the Western Front. Yeah, and to talk about some other scenes from the book that just show the brutality of it that weren't in the movie, like two that I specifically remember is how they talk about hearing like the cries slash screams of mm. horses that are dying and they yeah. were like, it was driving them crazy hearing these horses and they're like, someone please just shoot them. And then another scene is when one of their fellow soldiers is injured and they can hear him calling to them, but oh, they can't yeah. find his body. And yeah. they're like, he's around here somewhere and how his yeah. yells change and how he gets delirious and yeah. just, oh, yeah. they hear the progression of his yelling. Like that was like, yeah. So there were so many scenes in this book that will like forever be in my mind. And I thought like they were even stronger than the movie scenes, I think, because the movie is really well done. But the scenes from the book, there's so many where I'm just like, wow, like never going to be able to forget that. <laughs> yeah. It was just yeah. so well written. Yeah, definitely. Oh, so there's a scene in the movie, which this happens in the book as well, where he and Kat go and steal a goose and then they come back um, and they eat it. Yeah, yeah. And the scene in the movie I thought was really well done because they're eating this goose and they're dancing and singing and it seems like they're enjoying it, but it's sad music playing. Mm. And it made me think of this quote from the book, which reads, It's all rot that they put in the war news about the good humor of the troops, how they are arranging dances almost before they are out of the front line. We don't act like that because we're in a good humor. We are in a good humor because otherwise we should go to pieces. Even so, we cannot hold out much longer. Our humor becomes more bitter every month. 
And this I know, all these things that now, while we are still in the war, sink down in us like a stone, after the war shall awaken again, and then shall begin our disentanglement of life and death. Yeah, and so newspapers are like, oh, the soldiers are in good spirits. And he's like, uh, no, we're not. <laughs> Yeah. So that scene I thought really captured that quote from the book. Yeah, it, and so um, interesting enough, so Ernest Hemingway obviously was a contemporary as well during this time. Uh, he also participated in World War One, and so he, he's written quite a bit, and uh, he wasn't referencing this book particularly, but he kind of talked about how during the war, like so much in terms of literature was suppressed. Like poetry, yeah, some mm -hmm. of that anti-war managed to make it into the press, but it was very difficult for an author to be able to to publish anything, whether it was in a newspaper, a periodical, whatever, um, because at the end of the day, I mean, they're, they're trying to get soldiers to, to feed this war machine, right? Mm -hmm. So the last thing you want is this narrative of, oh, you know, this war is horrible. Like, you don't want to join. Like, everyone's lying to you. You know, this book, obviously, I mean, it took 10 years yeah. before it was finally able to, to publicate. And I don't know how long he was writing it, and um, but, but definitely... I think a lot of authors who kind of supported, like journalists who supported this war machine, obviously after it's like, it's, it's tough to take them serious. And I'm sure many of them, their career was over and, and rightfully so for yeah. you know, feeding what ultimately was the death of a lot of people. Yeah. So we talked about the part where we see the negotiation negotiations mm -hmm. with the leaders, but I wanted to share a quote from the book where he's talking about, it might've been, I think it was like one of his school teachers or something when he was back home that was encouraging them to go serve. And this guy's name was Kantarek. And so he's talking about how there were so many people like Kantarek that were misleading them. And it reads, there were thousands of Kantareks, all of whom were convinced that they were acting for the best and in, in a way that cost them nothing. And that is why they let us down so badly. So just being so disillusioned with adults. And then another quote reads, I see that the keenest brains of the world invent weapons and words to make them yet more refined and endearing. So I thought that was interesting too, how like so many brilliant people spend their time learning how to create these machines and how to injure people and hurt people. And, right. and then the politicians are using words to make it seem refined or enduring or like, oh, this is a good thing, like war, supporting, yeah. whatever. Yeah, and I think it's, it's easier obviously to do that from the German perspective in World War One because they, they lost, right? The reality mm -hmm. is, I mean, you had people... It wasn't just in Germany. I mean, they were in, you know, England and France and all these other countries. Like, it, there are two sides, obviously, to the story. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at anti-war material, and it's interesting because, you know, historically, like, you go way back, right? Like, the epic of, of you know, Gilgamesh or Beowulf. And there's so many stories where, um, you know, it's heroic. Like, the Bible has multiple depictions of, you know, these heroic warriors, mm -hmm. you know, David and Goliath. And, you know, I could go on. And and that's not just unique to, like, Western literature either. I mean, yeah. China, Journey to the West. There's a bunch of books where it's like, oh, yeah, this guy's out here, like, killing people and, mm -hmm. you know, doing stuff. And so, you know, this, the anti-war material has really increased, I think, in the last 150 years. The Red Badge of Courage comes to mind is, is one of the first, you know, commercially popular, you know, anti-war books. And then this one came out, you know, obviously several decades later. But it, it is interesting to see how there has been an evolution in, in sort of like the telling of wars and, and how they're fought. And that, uh, you know, it's not just glory and, mm -hmm. you know, going out there and riding around on your horse and you know at twilight there's you know real loss and uh and pain and suffering that happens as well yeah and with the world war one like at the end of the movie i think it says how the front line over like a year and a half they gained like hardly any ground mm -hmm. at all and so just right. how pointless it seemed too so yeah that one especially if you fought in that war and then germany yeah which they lost i guess but yeah just how pointless it must have felt and all the people that died, which there is a part in the movie where the Daniel Bruhl character, he's talking to one of the other leaders and they say something about like, oh, like these men, like it's an honor for them to be serving. And the guy, he's like, my son's dead. Like he doesn't feel any honor. <laughs> yeah. But I think one, one thing we have to talk about, uh, and it's in both the book and the movie, I think in terms of the story, I think it's sort of, uh, I don't know if I want to say the culminating point, but you talk about, you know, the progression, right? So this is a coming mm -hmm. of age story, right? There's always that point at which the culmination that, you know, that they've done it, like they are not the same person that yeah. they were before. And I feel like in the book, that scene was very much the scene where he is um, stabbing the British soldier inside of that artillery impact round, mm -hmm. like that crater, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think he was um, French. Oh, was he French? Yeah. Oh, okay. Where he stuck with him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he pulls it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, European. Uh, <laughs> so he like, obviously he's stabbing him, you know, yeah. like in per right? So you're, it's violent um, conflict that occurs. And then after the fact, he's, uh, you know, slowly watching this guy die. He's like gurgling up mm -hmm. the blood. And um, eventually, you know, he ends up taking out his ID and like seeing who he is. And um, 
his wife and child. Right, right. And really feeling this personal connection to this person he's, he's just murdered, right? And he had been a printer in his regular life. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, you know, you see this a lot in, um, you know, art where there's like this sense of being an observer, right? Like you're observing this war. You're not necessarily an active participant. But at this moment, like it's inescapable, right? You've mm-hmm. literally just killed this dude. Like mm-hmm. it wasn't just to pull the trigger. Like you... It was um, personal. Very personal up, up front. And, and now you're confronting it face to face. You know, it's, it's a really powerful scene. Mm-hmm. But I think the movie almost moves the needle past it a little bit more because I... I don't really think Paul gets any more violent in the book, right? Like that, that sort of becomes, you know, that, you know, yeah, he keeps killing people through the movie mm-hmm. as his soldier, right? Because that's what he's told to do. But in the movie, I feel like they, they took it a little bit further in that final fight scene. At you the very s- end. Yeah, you see him. He's yeah. just almost a, a robotic emotionalist. Yeah. He's just going out and he's just killing people. Like it, mm-hmm. it has ceased being an emotional event for him. And I, I don't think the book necessarily took it to that point. Um, maybe it's insinuated that, you know, it did become that for him. But in the movie, it's, it's definitely inescapable. Mm-hmm. Like you're definitely like, oh, wow, this guy has just... Like there is no, there's no like morality like yeah. lever anymore. It's yeah. like I'm out here to kill people. So here we go. I'm just doing what they tell me. <laughs> right, right. Which yeah, to talk about that end scene too. The guy is giving his speech, being like, "We're gonna go out and show that we're brave and whatever," acting like it's so motivational. And then seeing Paul, where like he doesn't feel honor or bravery or anything. He's just like you said. He's just kind of shut down. And at this point, Cat mm-hmm. has died. Everybody, all his friends have died right. at that point. Um, But I did want to talk about the French soldier more because that was definitely one of my favorite scenes in the book. The movie did a good job. That's the part where I thought that scene would make me cry in the movie because it was such a great scene in the book. But I feel like the movie didn't quite live up to the emotion that it had in the book. But like you said, in the book, that was more of a a turning turning point. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the movie, it just didn't have it quite as much. Well, I think he's also shown shown killing people too in the movie. Whereas in the book, it, it feels like that's his first time actually killing someone in combat. Right. Uh, in the movie, it kind of is like, okay, like, this is the first time stabbing someone and being stuck with them mm-hmm. for an extended period of time. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't know. And in the book, like, leading up to that point, he talks about how, I don't know if it's him or one of the other soldiers, is like, you know, our newspapers are saying Germany is right, but French newspapers are saying yeah. French is right, and English papers are saying they're right, so, like, who is right? <laughs> and right. just realizing that. Um, But I did want to share a quote from the book with this French soldier where he sees his name and he sees he was a printer. And Paul starts to be like, wow, after this war, I need to become a printer to make up for the loss of this printer Mm -hmm. in the world. And um, so seeing the humanity, I guess. But so I'm going to read this quote. Comrade, I did not want to kill you. If you jumped in here again, I would not do it if you would be sensible too. But you were only an idea to me before, an abstraction that lived in my mind and called forth its appropriate response. It was that abstraction I stabbed. But now, for the first time, I see that you were a man like me. I thought of you as hand grenades, of your bayonet, of your rifle. Now I see your wife and your face and our fellowship. Forgive me, comrade. We always see it too late. Why do they never tell us that you are poor devils like us? That your mothers are just as anxious as ours and that we have the same fear of death, the same dying and the same agony. Forgive me, comrade. How could you be my enemy? If we threw away these rifles and these uniforms, you could be my brother just like Cat and Albert. Take 20 years of my life, comrade, and stand up. Take more, for I do not know what I can even attempt to do with it now. So yeah, such a great scene in the book. Yeah, yeah, super powerful for sure. Um, And I think, you know, so kind of bringing it modern day, right? You look at the, the, you know, current conflict in the Ukraine, um, in, in, in the Russian invasion there. And a lot of the international community's response is an attempt to, to try to have the people who are causing the conflict suffer or at least feel the pain in some way, shape, or form, right? The mm-hmm. seizure, seizure of their uh, international assets, um, you know, freezing their ability to travel outside of, of Russia. Uh, because, you know, historically speaking, right, it's, it's ultimately this, the soldiers on the ground usually who, who pay the highest price. Although mm-hmm. I think that's one thing about when he goes on vacation is, is there's a realization that it's not, it's not just the soldiers who suffer, right? Like yeah. the, the, his family's on food rationing, they can't get meat, like there's a limited amount of food his Mm -hmm. mom's dying of cancer like probably has very limited availability of of medical personnel because probably so many of them are forward at the front so it is really you know in terms of the book it kind of shows you that yeah hey obviously the soldiers are carrying the brunt but there was an international price to pay Mm -hmm. and then moving on to cat i guess we can talk about him because so in the movie it's after john kills himself with the fork it's him and cat go off together and then they 
like are hearing rumors, I think, that the war is coming to an end or something. And then they decide that they're going to go steal a goose again from that French ranch, French farm mm -hmm. that they had stolen a goose from before. So they go back there and they try to steal it. They get some eggs, but then the farmer and his son come out and are shooting at them. So they're running away. And then later when they're in the forest, the farmer's son shows up and he right. shoots Cat. Which seems so random to me. Yeah, I and say. I was like, <laughs> I, like I was, I'm, I really wasn't a huge fan of. I, I'm assuming they're that. saying something about like, uh, like the younger generation learning from our actions, and this son is violent because of the violence of the adults. I'm not really sure because in the movie doesn't, or in the book, he just gets like a random shot. Yeah, in I mean, battle or yeah, something. yeah, like you're just another day at the front, you know, yeah. and it's like <laughs> here he goes. Yeah, so I, I I don't know how I feel about that change in the movie. I, I was kind of thrown off by it. Well, another huge change, though, is... Um, so they show the injury, right? He's exposing it. Yeah. It's, like, clearly an abdomen wound. Like, you know, it's World War One, So modern mm -hmm. medicine, you know, isn't, isn't quite there. Dude's probably going to die. Like, an yeah. abdomen wound in World War One, not not good. Um, in the in the book, it's, like, his lower leg. And, um, you know, Cat, like, I think puts a tourniquet or... or uh, sorry, Paul puts, like, a tourniquet or something on there. And there's, like... He's pretty confident the dude's going to be okay, you yeah. know? Yeah. And uh, the only reason he's dead by the time he gets him to the field hospital in the book is because they happen to have been hit by artillery as he's as taken he was him. him. And there's like a shrapnel that went through the guy's skull and like clearly killed him. Like, mm -hmm. would he have still died? I mean, yeah, obviously it's 19, you know, 18, yeah. World War One. Yeah, you know, if you get injured, there's definitely a chance you're going to die. But in the movie, it's like the dude got shot in the abdomen at point blank range by this little kid. And then he has to carry him for a while to get to the hospital. So, yeah, I wish the book would have kept it the same because in the book I sort of like assumed that most of them would die because that was kind of the vibe that I was feeling mm -hmm. but I still thought it was sad though when he gets there and the doctor's like oh you should have saved your time like because he's dead and he's like wait what I was just talking to him yeah. and in the movie also because going into the movie I knew he was gonna die so maybe that changes my view too but yeah not that it was unexpected in the book but like you said like the fact that it was just a leg injury so it was like oh like mm. he should be able to live even if he loses a leg but right yeah so yeah, and then to move on to the ending, unless you had any other thoughts from no, the I think I think I, I've hit my high points for yeah. sure. So yeah, in the book, Cat dies, and then from there, it's actually like a really poetical section where he talks about the summer of 1918, and then he describes something, and then he's like, the summer of 1918, and that keeps repeating. So it's this very poetical segment near the end. And then the book cuts, like, because we've been hearing it from first person perspective, but mm -hmm. then the last few sentences of the book, like you said, read, he died on October 18th, uh, and it describes his death. I don't know if it said he had, like, a smile of relief. Yeah, well, I mean, we can, if we, I'm remembering. We can, I mean, we can pull it out yeah. real quick. Because, um, yeah, it's, it's very short. Yeah, and it was, I, that surprised me of how abrupt it was and that it switched perspectives when he died. Yeah, so, like, uh, so you can kind of see here, there's, there's basically just two paragraphs, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to read the whole thing, but... Uh, he fell in October 1918 on a day that was so quiet and still on the whole front that the army report confined itself to the single sentence, all quiet on the western front. He had fallen forward and lay on the earth as though sleeping. Turning him over, one saw that he could not have suffered long. His face had an expression of calm, as though almost glad the end had come. And I read the whole two paragraphs. I guess I lied. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it, that's one thing I think a lot of times, um, you know, with modern movies, everything gets dragged out so much. And it has to, like, it almost feels not anticlimactic, but it's just so sudden. Yeah, you're just like, oh man. But that's how life is, right? Like, mm -hmm. you don't you don't see it coming and then suddenly it's like, it's done. You don't get like a 30 minute period of like, no, don't let go. You're going to make it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess that, that could happen. In some <laughs> but yeah, in the movie, which... The movie, it wasn't as abrupt as that, but I did like the movie. Like you said, he has that moment where he's mm -hmm. having a hand-to-hand -hand combat with this other soldier in the last 15 minutes of the war. Like, it's about to be mm -hmm. over. Uh, and then they, like, go inside this, um, not tunnel, like, like the, inside this room. Yeah, like down the bunker. In the trenches. Yeah, yeah, the bunker. bunker. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of pause and they're both just staring at each other. And so the French soldier, you know, you can tell he's kind of having that same experience where he's just like, man, like, you're just a guy like me. Mm -hmm. And then Paul gets stabbed from behind from some other soldier. And then the two French soldiers leave and then he dies. So, yeah, I did think it was a good ending to the movie. And I, I liked it. And then we see another German soldier after the war is over. And he comes over to get the dog, dog tags from the dead soldiers. And we see him take Paul's. But yeah, I think for this book and movie, like, like I feel like it's so fitting that Paul dies at the end of this, right? Like, at the end of the oh, book, yeah. if Paul continued living, I don't know. I feel like having him die really is the only ending 
for a book like this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's. I mean, and it's kind of completes it. And it's a tragedy too that if he did live and went back home, like how changed he is. But we already right. saw that on leave, right? right so right. we already got a taste of that of just how hopeless the situation is, whether he lived or died, like. It's just not good either way, really. But in the end, um, yeah, so I thought it was a very fitting ending. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, the whole German general scene, I was like, eh. But um, I, I think they did capture, you know, the tanks and kind of this this mm -hmm. idea that, hey, that the war was really starting to turn against the Germans there, yeah. the, the final stretch. And I, I thought the final final fight, fight scene was, was, was well done. Mm -hmm. um, but... Yeah, overall, like I said, I, I like the movie. You know, I, like it's always like out of five stars, it always makes more stuff. That's why I was like, oh, I'll give it a thumbs up. <laughs> but uh, I, like, I definitely wouldn't do five out of five. I don't even know if it's a yeah. four out of four, maybe a three point five out of four. I don't know. But um, I think on Letterbox, I gave it four. Oh, you gave it. And one. on Goodreads, I gave the book four stars too because I felt a harder time. Like I didn't feel as connected to Paul in the mm. book. But looking back, I'm like, man, this book probably deserves five stars because maybe mm. the character development, like, maybe wasn't my preferred way or whatever but mm -hmm. still like the book is just so well written and it's so vivid and it's definitely one that will stick with me so i should adjust my good reads or yeah you go back it. five star yeah yeah no i like i said I'd, I'd recommend the book to, to anybody definitely yeah. if, if you're an avid reader and a, a fan of 20th century um literature i don't mm -hmm. i don't think this is a book you can you can afford to not read i think it's uh and also because it's world great. war one like i said yeah yeah i mean in terms of like fictional world war one books it's a must read for sure um not necessarily my favorite fictional world war one book but definitely definitely up there and you know like i said at the outset right a book that stood the test of time has remained incredible i mean the three movie adaptations is is pretty impressive for, for a film and uh for a book i should say so it's, yeah. it's definitely a book that's uh stayed relevant yeah and and, and i will say the 1930 film like pretty incredible I, like watching it like I, i'm a fan of old movies in general but seeing that movie and how well it stood up to to you know almost 100 years now mm -hmm. and you're like wow this movie is like impressive how how they were able to film it and what they were able to capture yeah i'll have um, so, to watch that one yeah yeah for sure maybe do a comparison you know 19 yeah a follow-up video yeah 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 for sure <laughs> um but yeah so i guess we agree the book wins here oh yeah for sure um, yeah. and this movie though it's germany's submission to the 2023 oscars i don't know what oh, other wow. i haven't seen any other foreign movies so i'm not sure but it'll be interesting to see how it does at the academy awards this next year yeah uh, so definitely one worth watching so yeah, thank you for watching this. Let us know down in the comments down below on the YouTube video what you thought of this book and this movie. And if you've th seen the other adaptations, definitely let us know your opinions as well. And thank you again to Joe for joining me yet again, back by popular demand. Yeah, yeah. And if you enjoyed this one, hey, watch our watch our previous video. Yeah, we were soldiers once and young. Yeah, which was about the Vietnam War. So that yeah, was interesting yeah. too, because I feel like everybody knows about Vietnam, but I went into it not really being like, not knowing much about about why we went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So I definitely learned a lot filming that episode with that book and movie, so. And the movie won, right, on that one? I personally like the movie better because oh, the book, yeah, yeah. for me, was a bit dense. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Whereas this book is much more accessible, so I definitely highly recommend this one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome, well, thanks for having me. It's been uh, fun as always. Yeah, and uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this as a podcast, don't forget to give it a rating and review. I'd really appreciate that. And join me next week for my 100th book first movie. I'm doing the Joy Luck Club, which won a YouTube poll I posted. So join me for that. And yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.